gotta wait another ten years now. Yeah, I know. I have to wait, or at least five. I can, I can do the fifteenth. You're gonna have to get surgery by the time you're, you're yeah. actually gonna be able to do this. Well, it's just a variation on a follow-up themed mixed drink that my friend makes, so like, it's okay. not that hard. But um, so I've had the drink before, and I know it's good and effective. But it's no, I never made the blue variation of that. I've only had the green variation. The weird thing about that is, uh, the weird it's that's funny. The closest thing I can actually think of that's like this is the uh, is the hashtag TCM Wine Mom thing, where if you're watching TCM, sometimes you see commercials for their like associated wine brands that they correspond to different like movies or like filmmakers. So it's like you see some they're like absurd commercials, but they're talking yeah. about how like ooh, each wine is like the thing that's related to a movie, and sometimes you see one where it's like this wine is like uh, norm it's like Norma Desmond it's very lush and opulent and it's very over the top and extra you know uh, so you can watch this while you're watching Sunset Boulevard and it's totally appropriate and then we have the wine that's very much like Orson Welles it's very playful and uh, bouillant and and very you know if you want to have a bacchanal you can you can drink that one you, just, uh, you reminded me of that it's I don't know it's a vine but like it's taken from like some cooking. a vineyard it's a vine, but like it's taken, it's taken from like some cooking show or something, but it's like a stereotypical, like wine mom looking woman <laughs> and she's like making a drink, but it's just this clip of her being like two shots oh, of yes, vodka that one. and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it just goes for like way longer than you think it should. Yeah. Yeah. The hashtag wine mom. Yeah. Have they ever made a movie about wine moms? No, that's, that's from the director of Bridesmaids. Um, <laughs> Paul Feig. Yeah. Wine mom. Wine mom. The wine momming. Oh my god, that's annoying. Yeah, no, I actually had trouble because I was trying to... I hate how Universal movies do that. I was trying to take a picture of the logo for this movie, like when Krampus is centered in the middle of the reef. <gasps> um, Max, you did it. I'm going to have to bleep that out. Yeah, you're right. We should probably start over. Um, besides, you were talking about rewinding and everything, so it's fine. But, uh... Do you have actually, like, do you, I know, I know, because we both, like, have all the usual objections to consumerist Christmas time, blah, 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 but, like, are there any, like, holiday movies that you actually enjoy or watch semi-regularly? Um, I mean, are you asking me, like, movies that are very straightforwardly about the holidays? No roundabout tricks? Like, not a stupid answer, like, Die Hard? Uh, but a movie here's you, the thing about a movie Die Hard, you watch around the holidays, not necessarily specifically because it's the holidays. Yeah, hmm. I don't know if I do have one really, because like it could be any movie then, right? And I don't think there is one that I really associate with the holidays. Because huh, like I'm not religious at all. I don't like ascribe any special meaning to Christmas, but like I still do have that like little just like the spark of just like oh the holidays are a fun, nice, happy time. Um, but at a certain point you just, lo- you're like, fuck it. Yeah. Everyone is trying to just be okay anyway. So it's yeah. like, you might as well just be like fine with people being okay. Right. Yeah. So it's like, why get upset about people just trying to be okay, but also understanding why that's the case. Yeah. Under- annoyed. If you can understand, I, I get that. But like, there are some movies like a movie that <laughs> my mom absolutely adores and we still have watched like every year is uh, Bill Murray's Scrooged, mm-hmm. which is a wonderful, delightful comedy. Um, that was actually brought up recently because I don't know if you know this, you're not on Tumblr at all, but Tumblr is currently in the process of burning down to the ground at the moment. Oh, okay. Because they introduced a ban on all uh, adult content on <gasps> Tumblr. Because oh man. I don't know Tumblr, but I know that's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> but they have like, they're like, release these guidelines for what's going to be allowed on Tumblr now. And like, they use the most bizarre fucking language. So they're just like, no more fr- yeah, female presenting nipples are, will be allowed on the site. So somebody took a clip from Scrooge <laughs> where it's just like, we can't allow this custom on air. Well, why not? Well, frankly, because you can see her nipples, but I want to see her, <laughs> her nipples. And people are just like Tumblr users versus staff after the adult content ban goes into effect. Well, that's interesting. Scrooge is, it's a pretty average movie, like at 
large, but like. But I think I can understand where Tumblr is coming from because I know that after we start stopped presenting our own nipples to our listeners, <laughs> that our <laughs> that listener was real, numbers kind of went up after that. That was a really weird decision for us to just like have our logo instead of like being the eye in the triangle it is now to just like have a picture of all both of our nipples on. Well, the, the thing was we we set up this very sophisticated system where every time somebody <laughs> would listen to one of our episodes, whether it be from iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, we would then have their IP address of their machine and we could track them down and we could either one we could reveal our nipples in person no but we have male we have male presenting nipples which tumblr has specifically said is still okay on their platform ah so we're okay if anybody shares these on tumblr still we're we're gonna be okay well i mean we stopped doing that in general i mean but you did i uh, oh you've been you've continued you fighting the good fight without me yeah i mean you know it's not easy to go around presenting your nipples and uh (laughs) You know, at some point you kind of do lose patience. You start to think, why am I doing this? And uh, is it really adding anything to our film commentary podcast to expose our nipples to our listeners? You know, it was an interesting like niche to explore. Yeah, well, I think we had a monopoly. Everybody has to have their own gimmick to stand out in this oversaturated marketplace. And ours was exposing ourselves to random listeners. Yeah, to our, our, but only our nipples. Yeah. (laughs) Jesus Christ. um. Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. I'm Austin, and I have two nipples. Uh, and you have several as well. Yeah, I do. I, I I asked Santa for some more nipples for Christmas, and thankfully I got them. Um, oh, man. He'll give you all the nipples you want. You know what else I got from Santa this Christmas? What? The perfect holiday movie, which is going to be the film we're watching today, which is Krampus. One of my... Uh, which one? The... Oh. <laughs> The only majorly theater released Krampus movie. Um, yeah, I think the one with the bodybuilder. That one. If you see that one, you should watch that one because that's the one we're watching. Okay. Well, yeah. Everybody knows there's 80 bajillion like direct to DVD or digital on demand shitty Krampus movies, but we're talking about Krampus, like the good one starring Adam Scott. Wonderful film. Um, I really wanted to do the sequel to Krampus, Krampus 2. Ellipses, your sister is a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> that that subtitle oh, no, works thought, I, so much better. I like than the original title more, Caroling She Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. But uh, no, this is oh, Caroling Wolf Bitch, Max. Let's no. be. I don't mean to be pedantic here, but we want to present the right information here. Um, but no, I think this this is definitely like one of my favorite. Like, this is your pick. Yeah, this was my. Yeah, I think the listeners could probably figure that out. <laughs> This is the type of movie I like. Um, it is, but like as you've said, like I tend to choose horror movies and more recent movies, and this movie was made in the last thirty years and is also a horror movie, but uh, not as much as a horror movie as you might think from a movie. Well, it took them twelve years to make it. That's a, that joke is going nowhere. Just keep going. Sorry, keep going. Don't even look at me. Stop looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, probably one of my favorite uh, seasonal movies to come out in the past couple of years. I think. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but like, I don't think this is, there's no such thing as a perfect movie, but I think this movie almost does everything it sets out to do. Right. The best you could possibly do for a movie called Krampus. Yeah. About Krampus. I think this is something that certain people online talk about. And I think it's a pretty solid idea in terms of judging, like, again, different types of success for a movie. Yeah. And like, the idea, not necessarily placing value on the idea of what is quote unquote perfect, but this idea of like achieving an idea of perfectness when a movie sort of achieves all the goals that it sets up for itself. Yes. Yeah. I totally agree with that. But, um, this movie kind of came out of nowhere for me. I don't remember. I remember seeing a couple of ads for it before it came out, but like it wasn't something that I'm like, Oh boy, I can't wait for Krampus to come out. But it like sort of just kind of plopped out and, I saw it because I rec- I don't I'm not like a huge fan of any of the actors in this movie, but like right. I was familiar with them, and I'm as our listeners know, I am a slut for practical effects. I love all of that uh, the miniatures, mannequins. For, for like you, that makeup. is adult content on Tumblr. Yes, <laughs> um, makeup, prosthetics, just drives you crazy. I I love it. Um, so when I started seeing that the monsters in this movie were going to do that, I'm just like. Oh, well, that will be fun. Like, if if nothing, I'll spend some money to go see a monster movie yeah. in the theaters. Yeah. And then I saw the movie. I'm like, 
Wait, this is good. This is like remarkably well acted. It like starts off as a charming, like almost National Lampoon's hol- yeah, Christmas Vacation type movie where you have like the well off yeah, family and then the like, blue collar family and the blue the, collar like, suburban suburban uptight family uptight yeah. family. And it's like, oh, their goofy relatives are going to come. There's going to be conflict. <laughs> And then, yeah, and then it randomly turns into a weird demon movie where the family members all start dying. With Satan. Well, not Satan. One of Satan's minions, you know, Krampus. Um, I don't know why the Krampus, like, legend, like, just suddenly started becoming popular. In the well, I think movie. it has to do with this movie, but also it's totally like an internet idea where it's yeah. like, wait, the like, German people what the fuck germany <laughs> or like just really white people from that part of the world came up with like an antichrist for <laughs> santa yeah <laughs> of which course they did why not which already like i mean everyone's made the joke of how like santa and satan are almost identical words yeah but like there's a whole like mythos you can imagine of like evil santa things that that just work perfectly well that's we're, we'll get into this more as the movie starts, but like that's what I kind of love is like all of the the monsters in this movie, from Krampus himself to all of his little toy minions, with the exclusion of the gingerbread men, which is honestly like I'm gonna make a big bigger deal out of this than I probably should, but like I think the gingerbread are like a detriment to this movie. That's interesting because that hadn't really like occurred to me, and I'm kind of curious to hear like your one ding on this movie that sort of sticks out for you. Okay. Well, there's a bunch of things. We'll get to it. But, we, but yeah. um, as far as like the elves, Krampus, the Jack in the box type thing, the bear, all of them. Teddy. Yeah. All of them look like they're demons with like Christmas stuff, almost ramshackled on top of them. Like there's always something lurking beneath the surface there. And I love that idea of just like, no, they don't, because it, it's almost kind of like, the idea itself is silly of like Christmas demons and whatnot, but like, I like the idea of demons like putting a foul mockery of something that we hold like holy and Christian on themselves in order to sort of, one, make fun of it. Like you always hear like the demon hunter things is like, oh, demons knock three times to mock the Trinity, but like. Or they wake up, you wake up at 3.33 a.m. Yeah. Because Jesus was 33. Yeah, but. um, And he was a gingerbread man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. I came up with that idea, and I'm regretting it immensely. Um, you, Everyone is going to tell you how wrong you are. I know. When that, we all love when gingerbread that, Christ. When that becomes the greatest movie of all time, I'll just be like, I can't believe out of all of my ideas, this is the one that It'd be like the Grapes of Wrath with, with like gingerbread people. But, um, oh my God. I, I love the idea of just like the evil entities putting on a mockery of something we hold holy and then running with that theme. It's, well, some people it's fun. <laughs> I know what you mean. I just okay. wanted to okay. specify. We're going to get out of, we're both athe- atheists. Cool. Whatever. Um, I don't really think that's relevant to this conver- the conversation. I'm just movie. clarifying a point. Okay. Yeah. But I love that idea, and the movie runs with that theme really well, um, and I think it balances the comedic elements of the preposterousness of, like, oh, my God, there's the fucking <laughs> jack-in-the-box swallowing somebody hold like an anaconda, and it mixes, like, the absurdity of that with, like, the, oh, but that's, like, actually pretty terrifying. Yeah. On that level, this movie isn't super scary, but, like, I've, I've heard it called an entry-level horror movie a lot. Like Yeah, and that was something we were talking about beforehand as well. Yeah. In terms of, like, how this movie participates in the weird cross-section of, like, ho- like horror movies that cross over with other s- very strange, seemingly incompatible genres, yeah. such as Christmas movies, or even kids' movies. Stuff, sl- stuff like The Gate. Gremlins, or, to a degree. Yeah, and The Legend of Boggy Creek, or Monster House, maybe. Yeah. I mean, this is not a kid's movie to the extent that those are, but it is, like you said, it is kid friendly. Yeah. Throw quotes around that in a way that uh, forces it to use different tactics in order to communicate and be frightening, which is exciting to watch because, you know, it just forces you to be creative. And there's a lot of creative, great things in this movie. Yes. This movie, I would say, almost oozes creativity. It's yeah. like, uh, it, it's the type of movie that you feel like people had fun making it. Not just on set, but at literally every stage of the production, even though I'm sure a lot of it was a pain in the ass to do it this way. Yeah. But you know, this movie reeks of fun is the thing, which is, it's great. 
And actually, it's interesting that you you say that because in terms of the way the effects and the monsters are designed in this, I actually feel like I get a different impression that I really enjoy from it. Okay, I'd love which to hear is it. like it's almost like uh, you can say these are demons, but I feel like they're embodying a type of like biology in the way the demons look, where it's like. No, that's kind of just like the demon's biology. Like the teddy bear is a teddy bear, but it's like its stuffing is like its guts and everything, you know? And I feel like they feel very like actual, you know, in that way where they're like actualized in reality. And it's a really interesting look, you know? And even the movies that this this movie is like paying homage to in terms of the practical effects and wanting to do it in that specific way not all of them even really achieved something like that either. So it's really impressive, I think. And yeah, but you saw this in the theater. Yes, I did. Actually, I think I saw it twice in the theater, if I'm being completely honest. But like, I think I saw it once alone and then I dragged a friend to it. Yeah. Because like, no, you need to like, trust me, it's actually good. This is a good group horror movie. Definitely. Um, And I'm actually curious now too, did you know that it was directed by the same person who made Trick or Treat? And um, had you seen Trick or Treat before this? I had seen Trick or Treat before this. Um, I did not know until the credits started rolling. I'm just like, oh, okay. And then like it kind of set me up to like expect something slightly greater because I like Trick or Treat. It's, a, I think Trick or Treat is like the ideal movie to have on in the background for a Halloween party. Yeah, almost like if it's the ambiance of Halloween and this. Because Trick or Treat, I think, unironically embraces the spirit of Halloween. Like, this is what it's supposed to be like. This is, like, the spooky right. nature of it. Whereas this movie is more of a criticism of where Christmas spirit has taken us, in America at least. Right. And, um, like, that was something I thought, too, at the time. And we'll talk about that later. But I'm glad you're bringing all this stuff up because I think it's very subtle, but it's still it's still there. And And, I mean, I'll get to my own opinions in a bit. But it one thing I want to focus on, though, in terms of like comparing this to Trick or Treat, which is a good time to start talking about this, is how uh, this movie and Trick or Treat have to such a incredible sort of balancing thing going on with the tone. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. The one in this is it's balancing two more easily recognizable things, but also with this those things are slightly more at odds than I think it is in trick or treat where trick or treat. It's very much well, trying or- to go like with an EC comics type of thing. Well, yeah, trick or treat. It's more just like trying to keep the same tone throughout all these various short stories yeah. where this is like, it's the same story throughout all of it. It's, it's a just, marriage. Yeah. Tone, yeah. It just takes a huge right turn at one point and like, you're still on the same road though. Right. But, but it, yeah, you're, it is interesting. Um, because again, when we were talking about this beforehand, it is interesting how we were looking at this movie and thinking about it now as like the thing that makes this a little bit more interesting than other horror movies that pay homage. And I guess this is just part of my own opinion. Okay, yeah, it. let's get into that. Okay, I, maybe I can restart and I'll preface this by saying that there's a lot of movies now that come out and technically they're very impressive. And yes. I love the technical decisions to do something like they used to do it in the past. And then you get to the actual creative motivation behind some of those decisions. And these movies, I feel like sometimes fall a little bit short. Um, Could you give me an example of that? I'm trying to think of a good one. Uh, I don't know if I can off the top of my head. Damn it. I'm saying that this movie, and maybe even I felt this movie was slightly guilty of this until I watched it again for the show and really thought about it in a different way. Uh, I can tell you that I was a little bit nervous that Mandy might be that. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, technically, all the great decisions. But again, what are you saying? I'll say this. I Mandy that, was not that, by the way. I right. Know you haven't That's seen not it. the impression yeah. I've gotten. Um, I will say this. I watched Beyond the Black Rainbow, and yeah. I thought that was how I felt about Beyond the Black Rainbow, is that you're making really awesome technical decisions, but I feel like there's not as much going on under the hood here, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like I'm just watching... Uh, it's in a certain sense, like a home video fan film that's just amazingly well done. And the thing is with this, it pays homage to all those things you love from this type of horror movie that is kind of has a the very specific jovial tones. We'll, we'll compare it to Gremlins a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, okay. But yeah, we'll the, get that out of the way. This the movie. interesting thing that it does, though, is like Gremlins, it takes also from a different type of movie 
Where Gremlins, it's it's a wonderful life. Yeah. And in this, it's something like you said, fam, uh, family vacation. Yeah. Um, or what is it? Christmas vacation. Christmas yeah. vacation. Yeah. What I keep there's so many of them. Well, I can't even it's, remember. It's all the National Lampoon shit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So and. I think we were talking about this. It's really interesting how this movie really sets that stuff up. And then if you weren't really thinking about it, you might feel that the movie kind of drops some of those threads. It carries through the like character relationships and those pay off. But it, you might think upon reflection that maybe the movie didn't really follow through on a lot of the Christmas stuff that it was talking about in the beginning. And it becomes about Christmas in a different way. Does it follow through on consumerism when the demons are coming through? You might not think so originally, but it does, but maybe it does upon reflection, because here's the thing. If you take for granted very much that this movie is equally a Christmas vacation movie, as much as it is a gremlins horror movie, you now look at the horror stuff in a different way too. And you're like, how is this the same expression of a similar idea that you see in these other Christmas movies? And I think you can watch the movie in that way. And that's why it starts to really be interesting because the homage is like twofold and it tells you something new about both of these things at the same time. Which is where I think this movie goes from being just like a genuinely gimmicky, like fun horror film to like right. being an actually like really good movie. And then like a smart movie, yes. you know? Smarter than you think a movie called Krampus would be called. But Well, based on yeah. based on uh, the sample size of Krampus movies, I <laughs> yes. think like we have we have very little reason to be optimistic about Krampus movies when we do see them. Uh, have you actually have you seen any others aside from this one? Only clips, only like highlight reels of just like look how look fucking how stupid hilarious it these is are. now. Yeah. This one's really bad, guys. Look at this one. But yeah, I think that's part of the thing that um, makes this movie interesting for me. I had seen Trick or Treat before, and I, I don't know if Michael Doherty has made any thing really other than those uh i think he's making another film soon uh well he's making i know i keep seeing uh, trick or treat too yes, on imdb that's a thing. he's got godzilla to get out of the way first which i'm sure is just gonna be exactly what it is <laughs> i forgot he, he is doing war of the monsters isn't he um yeah i'm back I, I i've seen i was talking with austin about this because for some reason he always has a copy of godzilla's revenge lying around for <laughs> i've had it in my life for like 20 years now max <laughs> no but it like just get rid of it but no but for some reason it's like always front and center whenever i, I just come want it to distract you um but i've seen that's all, my dad <laughs> <laughs> godzilla says i need to learn how to fight my own battles um i've seen almost every godzilla movie and almost every gamera movie i'm a huge kaiju fan so like I was kind of disappointed with the first American Godzilla because it starts off really strong with like fucking uh, who it ah, shit. Oh um, my god! I thought you were talking about the Roland Emmerich one first. No, no, no. <laughs> it's like um, <laughs> well, hold on. It has a uh, Walter Brian w- Cranston. Yeah, Brian Cranston. And more importantly, well, equally important, Juliette Binoche, who is also in the movie for two seconds. Yeah, but the, yeah, the movie decides to like get rid of all of its great actors and. It gives you boring white guy number five. Yeah, but it gives you all that. It focuses on human drama that doesn't matter, and the monster that Godzilla fights is boring and uninteresting. But the new one has all the monsters I like, so like I'm yeah. probably going to be able to turn my brain off and yeah. enjoy that the, movie. The other one like kept trying to like have it. Ooh, it's directed by what's his face who made the other movie. We are not going to talk about because that just like yeah, I'll turn into Satan. Right in front of your fucking eyes. But I'm excited for War of the Monsters. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll follow up on that when that I comes feel like out. the tone of that is really going to work well. Whereas in the first Godzilla, I feel like it didn't. It tried to have its cake and shoot it too. Where yeah. it's like, we want it to be a Godzilla fighting other monsters movie, but we also want it to be like a serious Godzilla movie. Yeah, serious human drama destruction movie. Like It's like, okay. Well, if you want to do that, keep fucking Brian Cranston alive because he's the only human I care about in that movie. But right. Or Juliette Binoche. Or just someone. Somebody I care about in the movie, other than or like, you action men. Yeah, or like, you know, uh, I don't know. You have to do it better than they did it if you want that to work. Especially since Japan, like a year later, released Shin Godzilla, which was such a fucking better movie. Um, this, I feel like Michael Doherty, as we've said, he has a really good handle on a movie's tone. Yeah, so... Unless it gets messed with somehow, I feel like the tone of that one would be a lot more... You'd have reason to be optimistic. And even if the movie, like, is mostly trash, as long as, like, the monster battles are entertaining, like, a lot of kaiju movies are pretty trash, but, like, the monster battles <laughs> are say. entertaining. So, like, 
at the very least, you have that to look forward What's to. What's the name of the 1973 one where Godzilla is literally fly, flying like through the air with his feet first? Oh. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. That's an iconic scene. That's um, the one with Jet Jaguar. Oh, no, that's that guy, uh, Godzilla, the Power Ranger. Godzilla versus uh, Megalon, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that one is just the worst. No, that's Jet. I mean, Jet Jaguar's theme song is fucking amazing, but. um. Oh, okay. Where it's Jet Jaguar. <laughs> that, if you listeners go look that up, it's fucking amazing. Um, Jet Jaguar's theme song. But yeah, okay, so we're not talking about Godzilla, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, Michael Dougherty is a great fucking director. Yeah. Um, out of the two movies of his that I've seen, I have not yeah. disliked any of them. And so. you know what? I He does the homage thing because Trick or Treat, equally yeah. an homage to EC Comics, totally definitely. pandering to an audience. He does it in a way that's smart. Yes, definitely. You know? And often it's the that part of it that holds me back from fully embracing these movies that really like pay tribute in a really interesting and like visually great way to things that I also enjoy. But it's like, he genuinely does it in a way that contributes to it. You know, he's not just like being handed a baton and like standing there. You know what I mean? He's taking it to a different place. Yeah. And I think this movie uh, is the type of movie that will probably, as time goes by, more people will talk about it in reference to that idea. I know we discussed sort of the way people responded to this movie, and I think it was generally positive, but I feel like... Um, it kind of flew under the radar for the most part. Like people who saw, for the most part, from what I, it had its audience that would be like it had its audience. It. I think yeah. it's made it made its money back. I'm pretty sure, but like it didn't flop at the box office. But yeah, I don't know. But uh, you know, in terms of like the community of film people online, I feel like it's the type of movie that people would be like, this is a really fun concept, and I enjoy watching this movie. And it'll probably take some time before people really start to to think about it in terms of like a movie that. Oh yeah, this movie. What definitely made it? It was made for a budget of fifteen million, made over sixty million in the box it's office. It's pretty shocking because yeah. again, another thing, if you want to talk about Michael Doherty being like a really great version of this type of director that yeah. does this thing, he knows how to make it look amazing on really small budget too. Yeah, for fifteen million dollars, this movie does like yeah look like a pretty major studio production. And, and like uh, the commentary track on the actual DVD, I didn't get to finish it, but it's really solid in terms of how they discuss. So, sort of how they went about doing that. And there's a lot of cleverness. Um, he's a guy that knows how to use digital imaging very well and CGI and also use digital images to composite things in a way to seem together an image. I'll point some stuff out to you. It's kind of like shocking some things that are entirely digital. Yeah. Well, and also like using shadows to hide certain things like you never really fully see the elves for the most part. Like they're a lot. Sure. Yeah. Mostly hidden in shadows. Like that's great. Cause it makes you terrified of something you can't see, but yeah. also at the same time you're saving budget. Right. Uh, and it's, that's always the thing. It's the scene from the bad and the beautiful, right? Where they got to make, it's about these two filmmakers. It's a classic Hollywood movie from 1952. Go watch it. Two filmmakers. It's kind of based on Val Luton in some ways too. Um, but it's uh, it's Kirk Douglas, and uh, he's got to make a movie called Doom of the Catmen. <laughs> and they're trying to make money off it, and they're looking at the outfits, and they're just like, fuck, we are so fucked. Because <laughs> they, it's just the stupidest outfits you can possibly imagine. It looks like uh, Nicolas Cage in the bear outfit in, uh, in Wicker Man. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, when he starts boxing that woman in the bear <laughs> outfit and then starts screaming about bees. Ah, uh, not the bees. Uh... Yeah. But anyway... Um, so they have to do that, and then they have this great scene where they very dramatically talk about how they're not going to show the cat suit people, and they're just going to make everything really dark. <laughs> and they're like, we're going to scare the fuck out of these fuckers. And they start getting very excited and aggressive about it. Uh, and it's kind of fun to watch. Um, but anyway, that's the idea, right? It's yes. Th- that idea. And we've talked about this, I think, in terms of uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon and the idea of the sublime, right? Which we can link to again in this. But that's a great resource. It goes back hundreds of years, the idea of like, you know, things that are hidden or submerged within darkness or outside of our field of view or something, uh, just on the corners of our vision can frighten us without ever showing themselves. Yes. Which is another, the amount of self control this movie has to not fucking show Krampus fully until like the very end. And even then he's still partially shrouded. Like, yeah. And it's, I'm, and you can say that about the monsters too, but it's like that for almost everything. Like yeah. really listening to the commentary track for this by the people who actually matter, their opinions on this, yeah. the people who made it. Um, 
you really learn. It's very insightful and kind of inspiring. Like it, you see how much they use digital stuff because they use it a lot, but they use it in such subtle and clever ways that you never, you never like worry or notice about it. And there's really no way to tell either. You well, can't yeah. look at it and tell. It's like what we were talking about. There's no seam for you to find. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like yeah. it's like we were talking about, uh, I think it was for our Kubo soundtrack where it's like the pinnacle of, it was like nineties era, like Jurassic park type things where like, I always bring this back, but like you no, we were doing it for our event horizon. Commentary. Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, where you have the practical things and that establishes to your, yeah, viewer's vision. Like that's a real thing right there. It's a real object I'm seeing, seeing. And yeah. then like the thing, cause your prop is going to have flaws because you can't, create a fucking Frankenstein monster that's going to act perfectly for what you want to do. Right. So you use just little digital touch-ups to make that yeah. flow seamlessly, and that looks perfection. Um, it's a beautiful mixing of those Yes, things. and if you can pull that off, like, this movie yeah. does perfectly. So it looks I, great. Yeah, I think, you know, I saw this in the theater. I uh, really You did, enjoyed really? It. Okay. Yeah. I saw the trailers for it, and I knew I was going to watch it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it. I think this movie just has a lot to offer. And also, we haven't talked about the elephant in the room, the very small, subtle elephant in the room with this movie that I think really sells a certain type of emotional impact for me, which is the grandmother. We can talk about this more in the movie. Yeah, I think actually that should be something we save for as the grandmother is slowly introduced. But If yes. you've seen this movie, you might already have an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, Cause there's just a little inkling of discomfort that comes in through this movie that really like, you know, it, it, it sort of nails, nails home, like a certain level of authenticity to this movie that brings the homage to life and makes it something that stands apart on its own. Also truly. the, the grandmother flashback in itself is kind of a homage as well, which is yeah. interesting, but um, I'll talk about that when that happens. But honestly, I kind of want to just jump in. So yeah. So I think we both agree that this is embraced, but slightly underrated maybe? Yeah. or miss. I'd like more people to talk about it, honestly. Yeah. And understand that there's more to dive into here other than just well executed nostalgia. Yeah. You know, it's smart. It's a smart movie. So go fire up your Krampus machine. I was going to say, uh, get, get your Yule log ready. Keep the fire burning all night long. And Oh, that's right. You're going to listen to this all night, so you're you're yeah. in for a real struggle. Get the cocoa and... Get your gingerbread, man. Happy holidays. What was that? Happy holidays. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for that. Oh, I thought you said something, like, strange. Like you threw a Z in there or something. Oh, yeah, it's true. Merry just... Christmas, everyone. <laughs> our jokes are our gift to you. Mm, yeah, I'm sorry. You've all been bad, so you're getting cold. <laughs> you're getting shit humor. Live with it. Oh, what a wonderful logo. Yeah, and it's really cold. On the commentary, that's for real. They make the really amusing observation that somehow it's snowing in space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Uh in space, nobody can hear you question laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's lots of ice in space. Let's be real. I don't know if it snows, but it's very cold there. Well, yeah, but you kind of need water in order there. I guess that's what no, I'm Max, are either of us space scientists? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm majoring in, space science tree. Uh, <laughs> no, that's what comets are, though. Space scientism. And, but this is what you're talking about. The opening of this movie is very blatant with its criticism right. of commercialism and how like our lust for objects is kind of right. not kind of it's but exactly like the opposite of what we market Christmas to be about. Yeah. By the way, before we get too much further in talking about this, I just want to point out I think the extras they got for this movie in this sequence do a great job because you get lots of great facial expressions. Oh yeah. And this, sequ- lots of very fun facial expressions in this. I mean, this sequence is blatant, but like it's still fun and enjoyable. Right. Well, here's the thing that we talked about too, in terms of this movie where it's very easy to play the game of what if they marketed a movie without telling you that it's actually this, you know yeah. what I mean? And to the point, it's so easy to do that, that it sometimes becomes boring to think about. Right. But it's like, 
I feel like if you watch this movie and you didn't know it was a Krampus movie somehow, it 100% commits to this idea of being a Christmas vacation movie. Yeah. You know? And also with that cast, the cast works perfectly for that too. It's like you cast it for that movie. You know what I mean? And because you were really smart in the casting, all these people are also capable of being in this horror movie. That's what I was feeling, that woman. Yeah. When she's like looking at how much money she was turning over. I'm like, that's how I felt when I was Christmas shopping this year. <laughs> I just spent moving into a new apartment soon and I had to spend right. all my money on that and just I'm so broke right now. Right. You're like that boy crying. Yes. Or maybe you're like Jesus here, who's. Well, Jesus is a baby. They're like, I think oh, the well. wise men. Yeah. Okay. Oh, he's a reindeer. Look at him. Oh, that's a really new variation of... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. The sister is almost the most relatable character in this movie, honestly. But, like, maybe that's just because she's, I guess, the closest to my age out of all the characters. I guess. But she always creeps me out because I just know that she gets, like, disappeared, which is always the creepiest thing to yeah. happen in a movie where a character just, like, vanishes in some, like, really upsetting way well i'm assuming she was eaten by the jack-in-the-box thing because that was left next to her and later the jack-in-the-box thing talks in her voice to lure up the two uh cousins up into the attic so i'm assuming she was just fucking devoured by that thing but you're right you never see what happens to her Mm -hmm. so because of that it is slightly more disturbing thank you michael dougherty wonderful film right but again i really would really encourage viewers to not just take that observation at like the surface level here we have a lovely version of the christmas carol yes with a man who looks very much like uh what's his face uh from aguirre the wrath of god god i'm so terrible with names klaus kinski and max that's a very unfortunate spot to be in if you look like klaus kinski so i have sympathy with him mm-hmm. anyway uh I would really encourage people to really try to put themselves in the shoes of somebody watching this as just a Christmas movie. Try to forget that it's a horror movie because I feel like that really helped me this time notice new things about it, you know? And also how we talked about how you might feel the threads of that opening get dropped and how blatant it is and how much it's about consumerism and Christmas because there's no consumerism going on later in the movie. Yeah. But that thread is not entirely abandoned. abandoned Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to catch myself because like, I still genuinely enjoy this movie even though I literally watched it two days ago. So I'm going to try not to get distracted. If need be, I can uh, I can just smack you with the pan. Okay. Well, that I've got. Put some jingle bells on it to make it more festive. But You know, I could I could do that. Yeah. Just just for the audience, for a little viewing. I'm, you know what? I'm going to hit you with it right now. You're not even you're not even going to see it coming, Max. You're not even going to see it coming. Oh, God. No. Deal with this. He's messing with my headphones. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we have the Fox News ask the war on Christmas, which I thought was like a little over the top. But then uh, I was clicking on a fucking video game video on YouTube the other day. And the ad that came on before it was fucking Prager University being like, Americans not being able to say Merry Christmas now is an attack on our values. And was like, oh, it's not just over the top exaggeration. People are still fucking talking about that. Right. Well, also, I mean... There's no even reason to talk about that because that's also just yeah. a lie. But yeah, because no one. I'm saying, but people like, stop saying Merry Christmas. I don't know what the hell you're talking. I thought it was like hyperbole, but no, like people still actually act like that. It's the realization I was trying to act. I will lead the war on Christmas. Yes, I will be. Is I, what I will, I will do. be a general in the war on Christmas. I will lead lead the Blitzkrieg. Um, I'll be a pawn. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> let's let's fight the war on Christmas. Let's go. Um, yeah. The grandmother. I don't know. She almost does seem like the most like a human in this movie, at least in the beginning. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because her casting based on the commentary, um, which I don't remember all of, but there's lots of great information, but <laughs> I love this exchange. <laughs> what? The whole, just like they shouldn't, somebody should, yeah, some people shouldn't be allowed to breed, but, <laughs> oh God. But I mean, are, this... are you saying that you think Tony Collette is a good actor? Cause no, but I'm I gotta say, say, I'm saying that like, if we're going with the Christmas vacation theme, like <laughs> that feels like, Oh God, Tony Collette is amazing. Yeah. Anyway, as I was going to say, that's a very non controversial opinion yeah. to have, but it's interesting. You say that about, uh, the grandmother character, right? Yeah. Um, who I assume we're going to call grandma, um, uh, grandma yeah. here. Yeah. She, there was a freak casting thing going on with, 
trying to cast this actor apparently um, for this part because they had trouble finding people and a lot of them backed out at the last minute and she came on about three weeks before they started shooting, I believe. Really? And uh, she is actually Austrian, whereas I got the impression that the other people weren't because they pointed that out. So here's the thing. She's a very old woman. Yeah. Obviously, with lots of experience in her life. And when we hint at the discomfort that we kind of feel when she starts talking about her childhood and how people started behaving like, oh, by the way, here's the part where this will blow your mind. That house is 100% digital. Really? Yeah. I don't even fucking understand what, like, what they're talking about when they say that because I don't get it. It's weird, right? Most of this movie is shot, I think, 100% in sound stages, with maybe the exception of the opening sequence. Oh, my God, drugs. The reason that this movie has... (laughs) PG-13. A a drug reference. No, I think there's a lot of other reasons why it's rated PG-13, but, like, specifically in the PG-13 rating, it goes drug references for him showing a bong once. Yeah. It's just me every day of my life. What? This. Pouring it. <laughs> and two whiskey. shots of vodka. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, the point we didn't finish making is that there's an uncomfortable Nazi subtext. <laughs> or at least totalitarian, scary, evil. Yeah. Right? And I think it's interesting in, oh my God, Tony Collette is so amazing. Ah, God, I really hate saying stuff like that because it's so fucking obvious to everybody. Well, like, I don't think there's many bad performances in this movie, honestly. No, I think it's it's great. And I also think it it's great in a very specific way where, it, like, it's not just the actors are good. It's just, like, they are totally already 100% for the role that they have, you know? I think every actor, every role they have is is playing to their strengths, you know? Yeah. Um. But in terms of like Tony Collette too, I think she just so she's so good at doing like the uh, characterizations of this type of like suburban mom, right? Where she's got those down. That's like so. There's something kind of intangible about it because it's just literally just mimicking 100 percent and being that type of person <laughs> in that moment. I mean, this kid is obviously like the only like he <laughs> doesn't have a speaking role. But like, I guess the movie does kind of have a shitty attitude towards this kid. Yeah, whatever. And then he just gets fucking because it like almost like uses his like being overweight as a thing against him. Yeah, where it lures <laughs> him to the chimney. But yeah, but well, he's not the first to die. Well, you would think he would be because he doesn't have a speaking role. But no, he dies after the sister actually. But he does die because he wanted to eat a fucking cookie. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's simple and goofy, but this is also kind of that movie. This woman, who I love, who was on Two and a Half Men, I think her name is Con- Conchata Farrell. She does look very familiar. She's but... awesome. Yeah. I love her. Uh, and she was in Network. <laughs> That's where I recognize her from. <laughs> she has, like, a great voice. She has the type of voice that you want to hear, like, read a children's book. Yeah. And just see what that would sound like. But yeah, um, we never really got around to talking about the Nazi thing again. But one thing I think is interesting about that really, it's so subtle, right? But it's, it's just a subtext and slight implication. But you cannot help but feel it. Why? Because she only speaks in German. Yeah. Well, she can speak English, but she just chooses not to, apparently. Right. Yeah. She separates herself from everybody else. Yeah. And there's a kind of mournful quality about her, right? where you can tell there's some type of experience behind her behavior. You know what I mean? Um, There is something in her life that alienates her from this ritual or not even alienates her. It, it changes her relationship to Christmas from everyone else's, which is much more shallow. And even though hers is kind of ambivalent and you're not really sure what her attitude is, it, she embraces it and thinks about it in a way that's very different and more personal than everyone else. You know, Um, it's just, you have too many puzzle pieces not to sort of put them together in a way that 
sort of shows Nazis in a in a sort of vague way, you know? I would say, like, because I was always thinking that, like, because it's obviously there. She's that age. And yes. And she's German. I was always thinking that, like, yeah, she, like, it's her family. I thought I always thought, figured it was, like, the immediate aftermath of World War Two, and just, like... Or even maybe, like, leading up to it, the crisis of, like, the, the Weimar, like, Republic period? N- uh, no, like, I was thinking more of, like, like right before, like when it became apparent the Germans were losing the war, like okay. right, right before the Soviets like stormed Berlin and the Americans took the rest of Germany. Like I was thinking it's that where it's just like, Oh, well we're there's shit now. We don't have anything left. Cause you see your parents arguing and just being like, what do we do? Right. Right. Um, so I was always thinking that's just like her country's fucked and she's like this one child who's just like, doesn't understand what's going on. And like people are, pulling bread away from her and that wouldn't be happening if like I don't know I don't think she's old enough to like precede World War II but I think it's more of just like well let me put it this way it's not in quote unquote literal terms yeah but it places it within the spot in the cultural imagination that we associate with that you know what I mean um but but the thing for me that's interesting about it is like it sort of distances us it sort of acknowledges in the audience a type of distance from the experience of World War II, where it is this weird storybook thing now because it's so long ago now. And very people are still, very few people are still alive, right? That really had that experience, right? I mean, not very few, but like, you know, they're very old. Yeah, it happened a long time ago, and uh, sort of there's something interesting about that to me, which is such a like slap of reality about that and how in today's world there is a there's a gulf between us and those who directly live during that experience and how it sort of relates that idea of it being sort of something that is in the past kind of and distanced from us as like a story to the idea of Krampus as kind of being a story that is like from the past yeah and then how those things sort of play together with one another you know it's interesting I just love like everybody's such like a like again again if we're going back to the idea where it's just like everybody's such a comical stereotype at this point, but then like once shit hits the fan, they suddenly turn into real people characters, which is an inst- interesting transition. Right. Well, there's things you can do with characters in this way where it's like sometimes you, if you boil characters down like this, it's hard because you have nowhere to go. But I think the thing that really saves a script where you have to boil down characters is one, if you can boil them down in ways that that aren't like exclusive to them going in different directions. And two, and maybe the more important thing, is that you have actors that can sell the transition. Not even yeah. a transition necessarily, but just the revelation that there is more to them than the trope. just yeah. the trope. Yeah. And that's what this movie really hits out of the park. Um, I, I really, really think the cast of a lower... I mean, this doesn't look low budget and it doesn't feel low budget, but the cast of some sort of more strange movie like this is so important to selling the tone and keeping it on the rails. You know, I think people tend to undervalue actors usually in movies like this. And I think you, that's always the wrong decision. Always the wrong decision. Uh, Always get good actors for something like this because they'll sell your movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, figuratively and literally, honestly, because yeah. like if people see people they recognize in a movie, they might not right. otherwise see they'll go. And also it might elevate a otherwise this movie doesn't have a bad script, but it might elevate a potentially less right. interesting script. Right. But again, it's the tone. If you get a bad actor, the actor, they can make it bad because then it might, might not interact with this. It might not feel like, quote unquote, real life. Right. So this is clearly the, a very important part of this movie. And this is the moment job. where I knew this movie was going to be better than I initially thought it might be oh this one yeah because the movie suddenly gets real all of a sudden and like because like in you would save for a vacation movie you would save that toward the end of this right but accelerates it accelerates it and it's just like oh well it's like things are hard for them it's just like it adds character development oh but he does yes he does <laughs> <laughs> And also it does the twist of 
of making it more painful because he has sympathy for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which you totally understand in a strange way about how that is somehow more upsetting to learn than somebody yeah. having outright disdain. <laughs> He's got a very interesting outfit on, but too, yeah. by the way. Also, yeah, that kid, like... <laughs> He is like the most generic kid actor ever. You think so? Well, no, it's just like in terms of appearance. Like I know we're going to put it a quarter in the red letter media jar, but like they pointed out that like 90s kid actor is back because oh, he, he does look like, no, it's not the same actor, but like oh. it looks like the same kid from like fucking Jumanji and shit. Like, oh, I don't know what that kid looks like. You've never seen the original Jumanji movie? Really? I have. I just don't remember it. And he looks like that kid. He looks exactly like him, but He's a good actor. I don't know what else he's, he's been. Fine. In, but Apparently, according to the commentary, uh, he would subtly slash not subtly flirt with every single like adult woman on the set, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of strange to think about. Yeah. Well, you always cast kids that are older than the intended age, so he's probably what, like 13? Probably 20. Yeah. No, but I'm saying like, he's probably like 13 or 14 if he's playing a 10 year old right. in a movie. So like, yeah, I'm just like he's it's getting just like a really funny detail to think about. It is, but he's going through kind of like shocking. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, here we have our Pacific Rim reference, which I don't understand. I guess they really like Pacific Rim. Is that a did they say that in the commentary? That's a specific Pacific Rim reference. No, you got the Pacific Rim action figure in the background. Do you? I yeah, I see it. Maybe they just put it right in front of his face. Look. To the left of the owl. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, I noticed that the first time I watched it. I did not, but... And I, mean, I, I didn't change my opinion on anything. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a big fan of the first Pacific Rim movie. Um, I like... I think the Asylum knockoff title is the most perfect title for any movie ever. <laughs> well, it sums up Asylum movies Would you like perfectly. to say it? Atlantic Rim? Yes. <laughs> the best title of any movie ever. <laughs> totally. It's not even close because it's just there's never been such a like great combination of things that make no sense whatsoever. <laughs> but anyway, I, <laughs> Del Toro just recently came out and talked about like how like he was like talking about scripts that he had written that had never like gotten made by studios. And he talked about how he had a script written for Pacific Rim 2 and then just like threw shade at the movie that actually got made because that movie was hot garbage. But this movie's not hot garbage. And now we get it's cold. Suddenly. We get the lighting transition. We get sudden, like, oh, this might be a different movie. Whoa. Uh, oh, my God. Oh. Next, next, you're going to tell me those clouds were a digital effect, Austin. No, those were actually... Uh, <laughs> they actually summoned a storm clouds for this movie. Well, he, you had to do it by hand. They had men uh, hanging on wires up in the sky, and they just, you know, had to brush it by hand. That's where $14 million of the budget went. Well, surprisingly, that's very cheap, but, uh, but no, if you wanted to make it, but you can't just make a movie about clouds, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Otherwise everyone would just do that. Well, I think that's where uh, Roland Emmerich got a lot of his, uh, start for his disaster movies. Yeah. For Independence Day. Same trick. Yeah. Yeah. Just exactly. Same thing in, uh, in Poltergeist too. Toby Hooper just going up there. This is a weird joke. This is really weird. <laughs> I keep thinking that if we bring up how terrible our jokes are, it will somehow save it. No, it it's never, kind of making it more cringeworthy. Yeah, it never does. Honest. It never does. Yeah. This is like, and this is the move, like this movie could have, like we talk about it taking a drastic right turn, but it does ease its way into like the scary monster stuff. Like it would have been very easy for them. Right. It just to start appearing now. And then running around <gasps> the house. There's a snowman in my, our yard. Is that a reference to the 2017 film? Yeah, the, the movie snowman? that came out two years after <laughs> this. They preemptively knew how bad it would be. Starring Michael Fassbender, who plays a character named Harry Hole. Harry Hole. <laughs> I don't know if we should talk about it now. It's just that movie is just. I, I wow. know you really wanted to do that, and I kind of. I kind of like, changed my opinion midway through because it slows down. But the beginning of that movie is amazing. I've heard it's remarkably bad, but like I have never heard anybody say it's so bad it's good. There are parts of it that are quite fantastic. 
like the fact that Harry Hole is he's an alcoholic and he keeps passing out right everywhere and it's supposed to be really sad and upsetting when you see it but they do it like 10 times in the first 30 minutes and you just see Michael Fassbender waking up like in like yeah. different spots and it looks like he's just felt falling asleep everywhere it's just kind of funny I from what I remember I think that was boys in brown is they just said that so they didn't have to pay um what is it fucking what they say they don't say um is it ups that's the boys oh. in brown they they said boys in brown so they didn't have to pay royalties or the product placement thing yeah well fuck that yeah i mean they already got some quality product placement with the apple laptop front and center when she was skyping her boyfriend but and don't forget he's got an imac yeah of course. This is an Apple family, Max. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that would be inversed, honestly, with the dad being like, yeah, don't go over to your boyfriend's house. And the mom being like, I'll let her be a girl. Yeah, I don't know. So again, I think we're one of the things we're really interested in when we're watching it this time is the transition from it being one type of movie to another, but also how it's it's not so much a complete transition as much as it is like a transformation. You know, it maintains certain parts of the other movie and and carries them through, you know? And I think the thing that really sells it again is grandma because she continually maintains a sort of standard of behavior yeah. in this house that I think yeah. makes you, upon reflection, maybe even not the first time you're thinking about it, it makes you really feel that every part of the movie is present in every other part of the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Krampus is present in the beginning when she's making cookies. You know what I'm saying? And Christmas, that is annoying and shallow and con- commercial right, is present when she's trying to keep the fire alive at the end and elves are coming. Yes. She's the consistency that I think really helps bridge both of these movies and uh, makes it be a movie where the two halves of it sort of like reflect upon and inform the other half. Well, she's also the human element almost throughout most of the movie. Like when everybody's freaking out and turning on each other, she's the one thing like still trying to keep every, not even like being like, guys, we need to get along, but like, yeah, there is bigger shit to worry about. Stop fighting amongst yourselves. It like, doesn't even like, yeah, it doesn't register with her. Yes. And I think it's a really subtly awesome. Pro- <gasps> it's, it's Krampus. Yeah. And it would have been really easy for the movie right here to just like have Krampus yeah. jump down and start chasing her. But no, well, here's don't. another, this entire sequence is very digital as well. Yeah. Where most of it is a sound stage, but like, obviously that stuff is digital, but a lot of the snow is digital, which also is really impressive. Whenever you're doing any sort of like particle movement thing, that's always been a challenge with like visual effects stuff. Also the sound design in this scene, like like we have it turned down a bit, but still like when you're listening to this, like the howling of the wind and just like everything, like you feel how cold it is. You feel like the weight of Krampus whenever he hits a roof. Sound design for this part is really remarkable. Yeah, and that, I was really... <laughs> I was really disappointed with that part of the homage to Gremlins because the snow looks real in this. Yeah. (laughs) And I was very frustrated they didn't actually get that right. I mean, come on, guys. You did everything else and you couldn't get the fucking snow to look fake? I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, even just the way it's flecked up upon her, like, chin right now, it's perfect. Like, her hair is the perfect amount of, like... Slightly wet. Yeah. It is fantastic. Yes. Um, And you always think it would be a lot of fun to be the person who's inside the suit on one of these things until you actually are that person. And then it's just like hot and heavy and you can't see where you're going. And well, they couldn't see where it was going to the extent where I think they actually had a monitor on the inside of the suit. No. Yeah. It was like a RoboCop situation. I feel like you have to. (laughs) Yeah. At that point with the size of that thing. Cause it's just too much, you know? They try to move as little as possible, but, you know. Well, that's why you have, like... Or show, show, like, parts of the body as much as possible, so you only have to use props. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you have the hooves and whatnot. But, and, like, you have them concealed for the digital shots, so you can't, like... You, mm-hmm. know, you know that's digital, like, for all, obviously. 
but like it looks great. Nice pan to reveal. Slow, creepy music. Why not? I do love very simple shot reverse shots sequences like this where characters come face to face with something that's terrifying and sort of like presenting itself to them. If that makes sense. It's very creepy in a way because it's like the creepy thing knows it's performing for an audience, right? And the audience is both the character and us. God, this is so fucking like upsetting. Yeah. Um, Especially since like, yeah, she's kind of stuck up and like would rather be with her boyfriend than her weird family. But like, she's also kind of sympathetic. Like you get where she's coming from for the most part. Like (gasps) Max, there are two snow snowmen outside. Which is, corresponds to the snowman where he makes a snowman every time he kills somebody. Okay, we're going to stop talking about that. Um, <laughs> but I was going to add on to what you were saying right. about uh, the monsters performing for an audience. Because mm-hmm. that kind of gets back to what I was saying during the pre-screening where it's like demons wearing Christmas wear. Like, right. they're reveling in this. Like, this is fun for them. It's a show. They're putting on a show. That's why they're dressed up in these outfits. They are totally, like, living out the purpose of their existence. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and it, that's why it's creepy and why at the end it feels kind of appropriate that they're having like, like the Saturnalian like fiesta or whatever. Yeah. Like it's like totally the, the absolute, like, like they're, they're like, they're capturing their dream, Max. They're living the dream yeah. is what they're doing. And then we start getting character development that yet again in a different type of movie would have been safe toward the end for like, Oh honey, I suddenly realize I love you. Right. But And then it asks the characters to go further than they would in that type of movie. Yes. Also, I just want to mention that this movie, I think in terms of, uh, not just a lot of the way it looks and everything. Um, but in terms of like, literally just the lighting decisions it participates a lot in in paying homage to that type of like specifically 80s movie that uh is this type of genre movie where there's there's a lot of very specific like um i don't want to say like hard lighting but it you can tell that it's very much like a movie it's lit like a movie you know what i mean you have very clear points of contrast and uh, it's sort of colorful in that particular way. But I think the mo- this movie does it in a very interesting way where it's like there seems to be more control over a lot of it, and it seems to be done in a way that sort of like there's a more interesting type of like fall off in the light where things go to shadow in a more subtle and, and like strange way that I don't usually associate with the way something looks in like gremlins. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, also there's the interesting thing because the fire at least – according to the grandmother, like they have to keep the fire burning because that's right, right. what's keeping them safe. And that's reflected in the lighting almost. Cause like, yeah, everything is, it gets darker. There's and a cold. lot more black in this movie. Yeah. Than something like gremlins, you know? Well, yeah, but you feel unsafe the farther you get away from the fire. The second you go outside, you feel incredibly vulnerable, but like sure. even in the house, like the darker parts of the house, the farther away you are from the fire, the more you are in danger. And like, yeah, I but think- I mean, look how much like just, total black there is, you know? Oh, no, this place is interesting. Whor- but it definitely looks like Gremlins, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, Gremlins definitely is going for more of a Spielbergian type of comedy. And camp, um, too. Yeah. The, the sort of, like, cartoony Joe Dante touch. Definitely. But, um, no, this, like, this has comedy, but, like, it's also, like, it, it is aware it is a horror film. But right. Which I respect, because like Gremlins, people always call a horror movie. I, I've never really considered Gremlins a horror movie, but that's just me. I think it's a fun movie. I think it's more of like a creature feature comedy, if I can really say anything. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, th- I mean, the lighting thing, I'm not sure exactly how to articulate it. I think that might be the closest I can get, but I just see it in everything. Like the way they pull up and it slowly reveals the truck. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, where I feel like the movies this pays homage to and looks similar to, you sort of just have a clearer idea of what it looks like because it's more clearly lit. And this, they're more comfortable having like just a lot of black in all 
different parts of the frame. Well, the black and like light blues illuminating everything kind of reminds me of the thing, honestly, which is evoking a similar sentiment. You know what? I agree with that. And the thing has a lot of blacks in it as well. Yes. And you always get those interesting, uh, contrasty, like lighting setups where they have like the flare, right? Sort of contrasting with the blue light. This definite, this sequence, especially, I think, if you're going to point to something that's sort of reminiscent of the way the thing looks, I think is very oh, much definitely. similar. You feel, you have no idea what the fuck is going on. You feel cold. You feel alone. <laughs> <laughs> you have the joke about guns, you know, just like the thing. Can you think about how funny this would be if this was actually just like a snowstorm that caused damage? They go in with their guns. <laughs> and the family's like, what the fuck? Oh my God, we're being robbed. <laughs> And the boyfriend's like, I thought you said your dad didn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if this movie did go full comedy, that's where this would go. Yeah. It's like our front door broke down. We're sorry, but you didn't have to come to our house with guns. Right. You are taking care of the snowplow driver. He was drunk and drove into a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And it is interesting, right? It's it's interesting that, like you're saying, you have this type of screenplay where you start them off as the broad strokes type of characters, right? And then you immediately bring them to, to the conventional points of climax before we even get to the real drama and meat of the movie. But in a weird, in an interesting way, that kind of like opens them up to like have scenes where. Their, their character arcs are almost like nearly complete, right? Because they're open to accepting each other. It's just going to take time for them to act on it, right? Yes. So the thing is like within that time frame though, because we're, we've now passed the really big dramatic point that normally you would have to be building to consistently, you sort of have these moments where you can kind of have them like reflect on things with one another and you can choose interesting offbeat things to like use as the center of attention for that. Right? Like playing with your nuts. That's, yes. that's exactly... That's the nut. Yeah. <laughs> Grandma, get your head out of the fire. <laughs> no, she's a big fan of Metallica. She's going to jump in the fire. That's her thing. That was a great joke. I'm glad you made it. Um, but we have this... this oh, my God. Like, don't you feel like genuinely freezing watching this movie? Like they do do a pretty solid job. I think the best moment for me is just with the uh, daughter because I feel like the way it looks in that is the most relatable. Whereas now they're holding guns and watching walking through a house, and I feel like it's slightly well. This I is more know. a horror movie, ish yeah, with like the the weird illuminated light over a dark. Yeah. Also, by the way, a lot of the uh, breath in this is CG. Yeah, I can see that. Well, it's composited CG, though. So it's like they recorded somebody, probably some poor intern, who had to breathe a lot, and they recorded it, and then they, like... Put it over yeah. there. You can <laughs> see, if you really pay attention, you can notice, because it's not quite coming out of their mouths, but... I don't know. I feel like it... For a couple of those solid. shots, you could. But no, like, if you're not... There's paying. a good shot of uh, of the... Because um, that's the thing, when you, to sell cold like that, I think you need, like, very unconventional visual signifiers right yeah and that also comes down to like behavior right so the idea that characters are like sweating at the same time that they feel kind of cold is something that i think really helps oh, right definitely. so when you see um uh oh my god adam scott yeah 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 but also i don't you see his like sweaty forehead you're like oh he's cold yeah but also like okay not to at the risk of like sounding cinema sin Z, like how does he know it was walking on its hind legs? Like just cause he saw two footprints, like it could just, sure. Yeah. No, I don't know. That's the one, I think that's one line. That's always been like, that should have been for, uh, Howard to show that he's like worth something other than having guns. Just being like, Oh, oh well, that you, the fact that he like follows things and shoots animals. He hunts like he he's like, ha- what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like have, have Adam Scott be like, Oh, it looks like deer tracks, right? And he's just like, well, no, deer, well deers don't really. walk on their hind legs, so that's yeah. weird. That'd be 
that maybe is an improvement. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. very close though. But he gets bitten by a snake. By a tremors. There's a snake in his boot. No. Yeah, this scene reminds me immensely of Tremors, but... It reminds me of Jaws. Tremors, there's no sequence where, like, somebody gets, like, shook like that, right? Or kind of like in Jurassic Park at the beginning. Shooter! (laughs) Sorry. I get that, but, like, at the same time of just, like... You have the creature underneath, you have, like, them not fully realizing what it is, you have... Also, a really good decision to cut away. Um, yeah. D- right then. Which might not be the easiest or like the most obvious choice, but immediately it adds a certain type of consequences to what just happened that you wouldn't get otherwise, right? So well, you're not immediately sure what happened. Well, here's the thing the thing that sells the escalation of tension, right? That this is a new type of movie is not the fact that they got bitten by that thing. It's the family reacting to the fact that they've just fucking heard gunshots outside and several family members have not come back yet. That's the thing that sells that it's a new type of movie now. Yes. Oh my God, his name is Max. Yeah. Max Angles. Maximum Angel. If we're going to talk about communist themes and trying to destroy destroy Christmas and our American values, his last name is Angles. No, it's just Angle. Oh, okay. Just a singular Angle, not multiple. Yeah, he's the cousin of uh, the protagonist of Hot Fuzz. No. Jiminy Christmas. (laughs) Nothing, I'm just bleeding terribly. Yes, you do. Fuck you. (laughs) Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you think Santa exists in the mythos of this movie? Um, I mean, not that it's relevant. To no, this movie, but that's but an interesting idea concept to yeah. bring up. Uh, I would assume he exists in more of like, like I don't think I don't know. For my head canon, I okay. would assume that like Santa, like if we're going to have like demons and saints, he probably is like there is a Saint Nicholas that is a Christian saint that has like some sort of angelic power or whatnot, but probably not like the big jolly lives in the North pole delivers presents type thing. But that would be an interesting, I think the answer is no. Oh, okay. Well, I take my keys from the grandma when she says it's sort of like to believe in the thing is to believe in like the spirit of the thing. I feel like, okay, if you're going to look at Santa, it's more of like a metaphorical idea of keeping the fire warm if you're going to, you know, borrow the the metaphor from the road, right? You've got to keep the fire lit. You've got to keep going, right? Um, and that's sort of what the idea of Santa is. But again, I was always, because, well, she's saying to believe in one thing is to believe in the shadow as well. Um, so, right, except I feel like, but then Santa is the fire, and then its shadow is Krampus then, right? But I also feel like Krampus, we have a tangible element to this, right? And I feel like this idea of quote-unquote Santa and what Santa should mean and it, for Christmas and what Christmas should mean is like more non-specific and disembodied, you know? Like they never set up Krampus as like in opposition to Santa, you know? He's not like a supervillain, it's just this is a movie about Krampus and who gives a fuck about Santa. You know, he doesn't even come up really. That's, I don't know. I've Aside never th- from the letter. I've never thought about that before, but like Kramp- if Krampus is, if we're acknowledging that Krampus is like a physical thing in this universe, then like he's there to punish people who have lost the spirit of Christmas and lost belief in St. Nicholas. So like he has to have at least at, existed at once. Maybe he doesn't have a physical form anymore. Maybe he exists in whatever maybe. heaven. Yeah. But I still feel comfortable saying that maybe he doesn't and Krampus is just there to people to like terrorize people who lost belief in like what St. Nicholas means, you know, like, cause think of it this way too. Max tears up the letter and he throws it out his window. In some sense, he sent that letter. Yeah. And he sent it to the spirit of Christmas. It's just, not what he had in mind exactly. You know what I mean? 
And guess what? At the end of the movie, he gets his wish too, <laughs> right? It's going to be Christmas now, yeah, just like it used to be. It's going to be this perfect static image of what Christmas is. Oh my God. I hope you're ready for it. We'll get to the ending of yeah. this movie when it happens, but it's perfect. So um, in a weird way, it is a type of like sort of consummation of what that letter kind of seems to be thinking about, right? They all go through these character arcs and everything, but they do wind up. Uh, it's like a, oh my God, what's the name of the guy? <laughs> I love like the shitty, like super Christian Christmas thing they're watching on an iPad. What? Isn't that just Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? No, it's not. It's literally, it's like a... No, it is. No, it's like a shitty knockoff of it. Like, Oh, it looks identical, but it's no, different? No, it's not, doesn't look identical. It looks similar, but like, go actually look up Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer stuff. Like, that's like some like Veggie Tales Christian-esque thing of just like, let's tell a Christmas story, but put too much Jesus in it, even though... <laughs> I know people are going to get mad. It's like, you can't have Christmas without Jesus. But yes, like, you can. All the entertaining stuff about Christmas has nothing to do with Christianity, unfortunately. But well, also... Uh, it was all stolen from Saturnalia and from weird fucking northern cultures as just well. Just celebrate Halloween for a month. Yeah. For two months. Three months. Fuck it. Four months. Celebrate it for all the time. <laughs> Every day is Halloween. Oh, I think everybody would get sick. Well, yeah, there was an entire movie about that, which was my second choice for our holiday movie this year, which is The Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> oh, you just spoiled it. Well, anyway, I figured we could do it next year, but now we can't. You'll, Sorry. You'll forget. Those by are the th- rules. You'll forget by then. Sure. <laughs> Max, have you ever wondered how quickly it would take for you to board up your house? <laughs> that is a good question. Because you see it so frequently. Yeah. And you're like, that seems, I know they do things in Hollywood that aren't exactly realistic, but I feel like it would take me quite a while to board up the windows. In fact, I think I'd just skip it and just, just I know die. it looks more interesting with all the different shapes that are like slammed together, but I would probably just use one board <laughs> for every window. I know that's usually what people do in hurricanes, right? So I don't know. Does she? Like she seemed to be enjoying it. She was like in full Christmas spirit. She was making cookies. She was making hot chocolate. She was like, well, I think this is a point I never finished making about her performance, that there is a note of somber awareness to her doing that where she, you're right. She embraces the, she sincerely embraces the performative gestures of Christmas. It's almost like a somber duty. Like, yes, like, I have to do this. I know I have to do this. And she this. can still appreciate the things that are enjoyable and fun about it, but I think her engagement with it is fundamentally different than even somebody like Max, who genuinely enjoys that stuff, Yeah, but doesn't understand. Right? No. Look at love. And that's another thing. So we said the characters have character arcs. Right. Um, with Ron, like you think it's going to stop it. Like, Oh, he was the annoying redneck who likes guns, but then like, you mean Howard? Yeah. Howard. Sorry. Oh, um, <laughs> Ron, Ron Howard. Um, <laughs> uh, where's Clint Howard in this movie? <laughs> He's one of the Melves. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> this relates to the conversation, Max. It I know, you, I know you're aware of that and that's why you're laughing. And um, I think it's funny too. But anyway, you um, got damn Nazi or something. <laughs> Set off yours. Where's Grizzly Adams in this movie? <laughs> oh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, cause Howard, you think it's just going to be like, Oh, he hates him and he's the gun guy. But then like once he saves his life, he respects him, but that's not the end of his character. And it's something I like that. Like right. he's still that guy. Like when he wants to go out later on in the movie, he has impulses. He still has impulses. And like, he almost shoots <laughs> the dad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like, I'm starting to like you. Don't make me do this. I'm just like, yeah, exactly. It, it's good. Cause like it, you could still have a one note performance of just like, Oh, he's starting to, yeah. Of like, Oh, he likes them now. So he's going to act like that. No, he would still act like this. Like Ooh, ominous. Boop. Yeah. Again, more classic horror. We're going to sh- have off screen audio creep you out. Right. Well, once, always works. Once I know always this movie works. was made for only $15 million. So I'm like, wow. You see how many low budget tricks it pulls. And because the people making it are just that talented. You don't notice it when you're watching it initially. Nope. 
Oh man, and because I the love pr- that shit. The promise of what they're offering is honestly so tantalizing that you're like, yeah, you're like, it's like opening a present, perhaps. Yes. Ooh. You're, yeah. You're like, oh, I don't even know what's gonna come down this chimney right now, but, but it's gonna be so awful, and I love it. And then it's just this rusty looking hook, and you're like, that is totally good. Yeah. All like, of the Krampus shit, like the physical things of just like the yeah. hooks and the bells and the stuff, like it looks terrifying and stuff. <laughs> This is the only gingerbread I like in the movie. This one shot of it, like when it's actually a practical effect. I love the way they shake it too. It's, like, it's so perfect. I bet they, I don't know how many times it took for them to get the good shake they wanted, yeah. but it looks so like impatient about, come on, fucking go, go, and, go. And, and childish and like jovial. Yeah. Like it's just like, oh, come on, get it. And someone's like, they know this kid is a fucking idiot who can't speak for some reason. <laughs> Well, okay, here's the moment of truth with this character. How do we feel about it? I don't care. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't give a sh- I'm sorry, but I don't give a shit about this kid. I'm glad he dies. Um, He would be a waste of space and effort in the movie if they kept him around. I don't know. You almost didn't need him. I'm like, the movie treats him so poorly. You could, but like... It's just like, oh, stupid fat kid. Uh, you shouldn't have eaten the gingerbread cookie. The CGI for the gingerbread looks so fucking bad. I'm sorry. I don't, it's fine. I think it's fine. You'd notice it as CGI, though. No, but like, Woo! this is all, this is fine because like the gingerbread man plays a minor role in this. But like later on, when <laughs> immediately like, assassinates him. Yeah, but like when they're shooting the nail gun at Howard later on in the kitchen, like, is that why you don't like it? I, that scene makes me roll my eyes. Yeah, like I think it just looks bad. It like there's a a joyous tone to what all the other do- demons are doing but there's like it's sinister it's like they're getting enjoyment out of this but the gingerbread men almost kind of feel like they're from a different movie do you think it's like lazy um kind of it's sort of just like what christmas thing can we have that does it oh we can't do that with a practical effect okay right. let's have like shrek looking gingerbread men try to sure. kill the people and uh, also like there's so many i think this image this mo- like this scene is not just like well executed, but it's a, it's a interesting image where it's like, you have some reversals going on. It's like, instead the kid is being lured with a gift up the chimney. Yeah. It's creepy to see his feet dangling there. Like, like one of the people from Texas chainsaw massacre on the meat hooks. Right. Yeah. And the feet are just like shaking and everything. Right. That's another thing that would happen. It's a creepy if, image and idea. That's another thing that would happen if this movie is rated R. You know, that hook would be going like in his back or in his mouth or something right. like that. Right. But, you got to make sacrifices. Right. And I'm honestly okay. Well, honestly, I think it it adds to the texture of what this movie is trying to be yeah. opposed to that, which would just be that would that would totally end any sort of question about how mean-spirited this movie may or may not be towards that character if he got like a hook in his mouth <laughs> or whatever. That's the thing though, that like the movie doesn't really need that character. He's sort of extra. Yeah. Like you can have the baby, you can have the two sisters and like that's like a, a little fun thing of like you have this hyper masculine guy yeah. who only has daughters. Um and that kind of pounds home the max letter thing where he's just like i'm sorry that uh uncle howard wishes that his two daughters were sons right um have one of the daughters do that have them like get distracted by the gingerbread yeah. thing it's fine it doesn't go completely against any of the character traits we've established for them so far and it makes the house a little less crowded and then you can have the other one eaten by the Jack in the Box Anaconda later. It doesn't because they both die at the same time. Yeah, so. that's an interesting point. I wonder what compelled them to make that decision then. Because this is a very well structured movie in in terms of how it has every character uh, performing in every scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, every character has something they're working towards at some point in the movie. Okay, I wanted to talk about this okay, flashback here we sequence go. real quick, where yeah. we have. The nightmare before Krampus was slowly happening. <laughs> this is like, it. I was thinking that like, this is a mixture of a lot of things. Like, it reminds me of like some German expressionist stuff to almost with like right. the extreme it's angles. Kind of like Lot Reiniger esque yeah. in um, some ways. It also like, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like, like you were saying the old Rudolph and like, old stop animation type yeah, Christmas special stuff. It's, I mean, it's obviously, it kind of almost looks nicer than that because it's made modernly, but like it has that same kind of effect. And I think that's kind of yeah. what they were going for. 
I don't know, man. This seems yeah. like Weimar Republic stuff to me. This seems like prelude to awful, even worse stuff. You know what I mean? And and again, did you get this feeling in the theater that there was like you just you the Nazis are too big to escape? I got from a, this. Type I got of a character. World War II theme. I always felt that it was like aftermath Germany of just like the country is fucking destroyed after the World War. And just no, like, I mean, but I think it's like. World War One destroyed no. because what I see is like she's I see, not that old though. Like okay, but you're thinking about it in literal terms, and I'm thinking about this as like not literally, but she is symbolic of an old person who experienced something that is still sort of within that grasp. I'm not really judging it in terms of her age. I'm just list thinking about what I know about Germany. Right, I'm thinking that the country is destroyed and desperate after World War One. And it's a time of extreme anxiety. And what happens in, during extreme anxiety? You make a bad decision. They didn't choose to get involved with World War One. They did with World War Two. With, with with World War Two, they they went to that. You know what I'm, I'm saying? There was a voluntary I movement in the culture. At. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And she makes the same mistake Max makes. And then Krampus arrives. You know what I'm saying? And she thought it was bad before, but now it's different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was not bad before. Now it's bad. And now it's really awful because she's responsible for it in some sense. And this is the weird Nazi thing I get. is like the movement from one bad thing to a totally different bad thing that recontextualize yeah and recontextualizes everything you've been through and will change your life and uh she will not forget it i do like because the movie actually like the movie would be seem silly if like everybody instantly believed her for this right um but at the same time like we've already established that like things are going on that we don't know what's happening and like the mother's literally seen a demon gingerbread man like <laughs> i just saw a gingerbread man come to life yeah um Howard was attacked by a weird trauma monster underneath the snow. So they know something's weird, but like Howard rejects it at first, but then like shit starts happening and then they're like, Oh, okay. Fuck. Okay. <laughs> God damn it. She's right. Right. But, the moment you see the visual evidence of yeah. like weirdness, you're like, it might as well be a Krampus thing as, <laughs> as much as it might be anything else. Yeah. I mean, you were dragged by a weird snow monster. What, had, what do you think that is? Well, here's my other question. The only real question I have, I think, about this movie is, you didn't go upstairs <laughs> immediately after this happened? You weren't, like, run out? If you don't believe something really insane is happening, what's stopping you from just being like, what is that? Pulling my son up the chimney. Yeah. I'm going to look upstairs or go outside. Is there a helicopter outside? I don't know. <laughs> There's somebody on my roof kidnapping my child. That's weird. Yeah, would I stop to listen to an old woman who doesn't speak my language and I have no idea what she's saying? Yeah. Well, no. she was speaking English. Oh, she was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's we had the. That's where you get the break. Yeah, the aunt making yeah. the, the joke of oh English. I knew it. But this is how I protect my kids. <laughs> That's a really interesting line, though, too. Yeah. You know? Oh, my God. It's an army of snowmen! Well, I always... The snowmen are all the people they've killed, at least. Yeah. Oh, my God. I was joking about that, and it was a terrible joke, and now it's true. But, it, no, it has been true, because, like, I, yeah. I, I thought the first snowman was supposed to represent the boyfriend. Right. Because that's, like, the first... Or person. the driver. Or the driver. Yeah. But the boy... Like... We, we see the driver's body, but, like, we don't know where the boyfriend went, but that's the inciting incident for her to leave the house. We get another one after the daughter dies. We get one after he dies. Right. And can I point something out to you real quick? You know how I mentioned Tony Collette has that magical ability to sell the, like, suburban mom thing? Yes. I also think it was a very prudent, tactical decision to use her reaction and her shutting the door as the person who emotionally sells to us that now we understand that weird shenanigans are happening oh, supernaturally. Yeah. She looks legitimately terrified. You like, let Tony Collette do that. No offense to anybody else. Yes. But you just let her do that if she's in, in your movie. And then you don't have to worry about it. It's not a question anymore because she'll just shut the door and she'll be like, listen, this is what it is. And I do like how they're all dealing with this in their own way. Like she like 
yeah goes back to the presents and like later on she's up in the attic being like oh i want to wrap presents for the kids before christmas and like that's how she's processing this it's it's done in a re- in a surprisingly real way for a movie a demon krampus movie like right and it forces them into the same like isolated like conditions that you would have in the you know, family you know, Christmas vacation type movie. You know what I mean? There's an obligation for them to stay together, except this time it's like, it sells the obligation way more because it's weird Krampus horrifying shit <laughs> that keeps you from leaving when you're annoyed with your relatives. I do love that moment. It's like the one interaction they really have in the movie. Which one? Or the on like, uh, the grandmother is saying something in German. Max is like, Oh, I don't know what she's saying. And then the aunt just goes, she's saying we're fucked. Right. And the, aunt, and the grandmother yeah. just goes, eh, yeah. It's like, how did you know that? Well, I, I know yeah. when people are saying that. So I don't That's know. why I want to hear her read a children's book. Yeah. Why not? Go to fuck to bed. That one. <laughs> That's the one that everyone reads, right? Go With the, the serious voice, like John Malkovich. Yeah. Go the fuck and, to and, sleep. And I think, Oh yeah. Or who is it? It's Samuel L. Jackson. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go the fuck to bed. Please. Do you? Yes, you do, because you saw a demon gingerbread man. <laughs> That's why you had like a panic attack when the door was open. Okay. Honest, impossible question. Yeah. In this situation. <laughs> <laughs> what is the point for you where you're like, I get, okay, I guess, I Krampus. Mean, once I see a physical thing like she has, I'm pretty sure I'm believing. Seeing I mean, is believing. But I don't know. As long as I haven't taken like many drugs recently, I'm not going to be like, oh, that was a thing that actually just happened. I'm not. I don't know. I think I might just (laughs) I think I might just like drink. (laughs) (laughs) I think I might just drink myself to death and just be like, listen, either one, it's real and I'm fucked or two, it's real in my mind and I'm fucked. (laughs) So, so I'm I don't know. Drink myself, and either I'm going to wake up with the bad hangover, or I'm not going to wake up at all. We'll see which one. <laughs> if is. I'm too hungover, then I won't even notice what they're doing. So I don't know. I love her facial acting in this. Who? Her. I mean, Tony Collette's great, but like, oh, the aunt. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, she is the aunt, but there's the aunt, and I guess the great aunt. Um. But yeah, they don't ever call her an aunt, despite that's what she is. But um, no, like I genuinely believe she's just sort of like in shock and trying to do something familiar to right. get out of it. Right. You know, I think uh, one thing you maybe don't don't see visually in a lot of this movie, but I think it's done in the writing very thoroughly in a lot of this, is they did a lot of homework for the characters, which you see in a lot of movies. That's something that a lot of writers do. But I feel like it's really hard to carry that through in a recognizable way, not only on paper, but through the performances and then in the final product of the movie. Uh, One other movie that I think is maybe the best example of it off the top of my head is Alien. Okay. They don't really tell you a lot about any of those characters, but all those characters had very in-depth like dossiers written on them. Yeah. For their entire history or whatever that they had to inhabit. And because the char- the actors were familiar with it, they were enabled to inhabit that person and express all of those possibilities and things in, you know, their characterizations or whatever they're doing. <gasps> oh, it's Krampus. Oh, it's the Krampus. I think if I saw something like that, I would never fucking take <laughs> the binoculars away. And I'm like, if I just do this, I'll be safe because it can never move towards me. Or if I do, I, I know that it's happening. What is it? Following jump scare game tactics where like, if, as long as you're looking at it, it can't move. But like, you're like ah! I'm looking at you, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror. Mm. What game is that? Where like, as long as you're looking at the creature, it can't move. The second you look away, it can. Um, I forget. What? Oh, like a video game? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I know. I'm much more of the... Is it a uh, Quop? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Your favorite game. You play, I love that game. You play Quop professionally, actually. I played Quop at the Olympics. <laughs> Five-year champion. Yeah. No one else was there. Yeah, see, this is where it pretty much hammers home that she was eaten by the thing. Oh, you mean the sister? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just in the attic. Come up, children. Come up to the attic. A 
Although to be, yeah. and to, now they both die, so it doesn't. Right, there is a little bit of weirdness when you when you think of that in terms of the boy character. Well, like, and you could have had like an emotional response from one of the sisters because like they're basically treated as the same character. Yes, they are the tw- the like twins sister thing. You and know, you could have had an emotional response yeah. from like one of them lo- basically losing their other half. Like, yeah, that is that is a good point. That's a good point. I'm trying to think of a value of doing it this way that that option might might exclude, but I can't think of one. You know what I mean? I can't think of what this does doing it this way, what it has to offer that doing it that way wouldn't have to offer. I'm not saying I can write a better movie than Krampus because shit, I can't. But look at the dog. Look at the dog. I love bulldogs. Oh, God. Although it's highly, highly uh, bullshit that this bulldog would actually, in my mind, fight with a uh, giant jack-in-the-box monster. I feel like bulldogs are too stubborn. They're just like going to be like, what do you want me to do? What? Well, it does. Oh, no thanks. I mean, it eats the gingerbread men later, so it's the real hero of the movie. That would make sense to me. Yeah. To, it gets rid of that part of the movie, so I'm forever indebted to that bulldog. Right. I'm playing up how much I hate the ginger. That's like really just a minor ding on the movie for me. I think it's slightly tonally inconsistent with the rest of it, but that's about it. You just worried that Michael Doherty is going to steal your idea. Oh, yeah. For your passion of the Christ. <laughs> I was trying to think of a good gingerbread pun for that, but um, didn't didn't come up. Because I really don't like that idea, and it was an offhand comment I made that you're much more in love with than I am. And I can't get it out of my mind. <laughs> I just imagine like a gingerbread on the cross, like Willem Dafoe at the end of The Last Temptation. Yeah. Oh my God, we're about to. It is accomplished. What the? Oh God, we're about to say the reveal of this thing is like one of my favorite practical effects. Oh, the, the Jack in the Box. Yeah. Yeah. It is a great reveal. I think this movie um, does a really good job of like balance balancing all these amazing images that feel like oh you had the image first. Yeah. And then you found a way to work towards it. Except it does a really good job of sewing those things together and you don't feel like there's a any sort of like awkwardness in getting to any of these points in the story. Right? But it definitely feels like the type of thing where it's like, oh, you thought it would be really creepy to see this. You right? had this you had the design before you had the script. Right. Or you had the idea of this type of monster and you're like, what is a great way to introduce this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This movie ha- is very good uh, with balancing the type of like dramatic reveal with like the narrative logic that leads to it in an organic way. Because honestly, I know this is no surprise, but like every time you have a dramatic reveal that is like contrived, it totally saps the power of that. You know what I mean? It doesn't really work as well if it doesn't make sense. And can I ask, did you not like this moment during the theater the first time you watched it? It's kind of honestly like it's lessened like my dislike of it has lessened yeah. the more I've watched it. But no, I remember like specifically coming out of the theater and like that being my one real complaint about the movie. But um just because I think it looks so cartoony like when I'm not inherently against CG animation, but like when you have such strong practical effects like fucking this, like this terrifying monstrosity um in your movie and then you have cartoony gingerbread men like it's just such a look at that. Mm-hmm. Fucking look at that. Um, it's almost like a little uh, taking some some moves from uh, aliens. Yeah. He I, introduced the little like sack part of it first. Yeah, but I love the little delicate, like the it like wiping its lips after it fucking swallows a child whole. Right. But then like you have this, like <laughs> it just like aesthetically it doesn't continue You have on. the crazy jack of the box and then you just have goofy gingerbread folk. Yeah. Yeah. And it also kind of breaks the theme that the other creatures in the movie have that I was saying before of like demons underneath Christmas apparel. Cause these are just like they're gingerbread men. That's, right. That's all they are. And it's so we can have this hilarious sequence that ends with a dog eating a gingerbread man. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying I think to I agree with you. Yeah. It's not the same. It's not using the imagery in the same way. And also gingerbread people are like way less like intimidating. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
like all the shit in this attic is way creepier. You have like the angel from the top of the Christmas tree, except yeah. now it's like a satanic, <laughs> creepy like porcelain doll thing that's been possessed. And also, here's the other thing about both this and the Jack in the Box monster. And Teddy here. Yeah. Right? Is that they're like recognizable variations that are scary on Christmas imagery. Whereas yeah. These are just... They're gingerbread men. Yeah. They're just gingerbread Like people. I said, Shrek. Yeah. And all... Yeah, honestly, that also might not help. The fact yeah. that everyone knows that stupid gingerbread... <laughs> yeah. Gingerbread dude from Shrek... I mean, okay, I'm going to go back. Like, when that movie came out, that is, like, that's a fun little line. Like, the interrogation with the gingerbread man, with the muffin man thing. That's fun. It's fine. Before, the muffin man! Yeah. Before right. Shrek became what it is today. But us <laughs> giving her a wet willy. Oh, 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 my God! <laughs> and, like, yeah, because I'm, like, I'm, like, genuinely terrified of, not, like, terrified, but, like, I'm scared of these things. I'm uncomfortable around them. They're unnatural and fucking weird. I don't like them, but like the right. gingerbread man, I'm just like, you're They're just a comical, stupid version of something that already exists. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then we get this. Here's a question. If they were on fire first, <laughs> would that help? Um, you know what might help? Honestly, if, like, they get enraged and they suddenly are, like, on fire and they're trying to stab him and he's trying to avoid them because if they just touch him, he'll catch on fire. <laughs> or, like, something. I don't if know. If you do it, literally not just the same as an animated gingerbread person, right? Or even if you do, just, like, have it so, like, you do something with, like, one of the elves or Krampus himself, like... Or something different. Sliding something, something into the Something a little bit more oven, intimidating like, or whatever, yeah. Yeah, like, tie them in because right now they just kind of feel out of place, but... Yeah, but everything in this room is is amazing in this sequence and they yeah. all have their little animal they gotta fight which one is your favorite um do you have one I like them all for different reasons <gasps> uh, oh, he's dead um cause I like all the props um let's see it's like the angel looks great I was gonna say that I probably like the robots the least out of the ones in the attic um sure the robot one is the least specific to like Christmas. Yeah. I um, feel like even more so than Teddy for some reason. I like, I, I think it's a tie between the Jack in the box and the angel, honestly. Mm -hmm. Cause bo both of those are just, but like, do you have a favorite for the movie? Uh, for the movie altogether. Are we including like Krampus and the elves himself sure. or sure. Oh, well Krampus, I think by far is the best design. Like, okay. I think he looks amazing. The at, weird leather face situation. Yeah. He's got where it's like, he's wearing almost yeah. like a Santa mask on top of him. Um, which is in itself terrifying. Right. Um, but as far as his minions go, if I have to give a slight edge, it's going to be the Jack in the box monster. Um, right. And I feel like the elves are pretty nondescript, but I think I enjoy the way they look the most because, uh, I don't know. I'm just, I really enjoy when you get like really good, like dancers or whatever oh, to no, be like in, inside your like outfit and they are able to make it move in a really specific way. No, it's it's great. <laughs> that thing. They get a lot of mileage out of just having noise and shots of the ceiling. It's totally yeah. a low budget movie trick and I love it. <laughs> It'd be more interesting if it was just Christmas cookies he got his ass kicked by. What if it was just animated Christmas cookies? Yeah. Or how about this? What if he goes into the room and there's a ton of Christmas cookies there already? And it's like new Christmas food. And somehow it's all animated. Why the and just fuck would you send the dog into there? What makes you think that it's not just going to fucking right. devour the dog instantly? But also, like, what is this like? A diehard house where the like <laughs> the air vents are like massive. I mean, I know it's been said to death, but like air vents are like mostly designed for air to pass through them. Yeah. And not like whatever animals or whatever. Yeah, it is what it is. 
This is one of the goofier parts of the movie. But. If they got that wrong, if they didn't do that, I'd be disappointed. We all know that in movies, air vents are huge. Mm, yeah. I just don't buy that this thing would lose a fight to a dog and one that a stubborn, lazy bulldog would be like, I'm going to fight a monster. Yeah. Also, I'd shoot it. Oh, my God. The Probably roar of its thing. right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's almost like a bride of chucky looking thing but like act yeah. actually scary looking as opposed to i don't know oh my god he's mm. still alive yeah i really like teddy to be honest no it looks great <laughs> oh teddy gets the short end of the stick both times we never get to see teddy do anything like really cool <laughs> and that's fun but it is fun to watch Teddy like return from the dead after his eye has been stabbed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, where the movie. Uh, this is where the movie remembers it's supposed to be goofy. Finish it. Elves. Yeah. Oh my god, I can't believe we made that connection, <laughs> and how appropriate it is for this movie. This is very much an anti-Christmas situation mm -hmm. going on. We're, we're actually the brotherhood of anti-Christmas. <laughs> yes, the brotherhood, the brothers of anti-Christmas. <laughs> yes. Hashtag anti-Christmas. <laughs> that should be in the hashtags for when we post this. Absolutely. I would, yeah, I know there's a lot of show don't tell for the elves. I do love the idea of them though. Wait, what? Well, cause like we don't like ev the elves are kind of shrouded in darkness. Right. So we don't really get to see them, but like, I like that. Like I'm fine with that. Right. But, like, there is a small part of me that would like to see their more designs, but that's just the part of me that enjoys practical effects and makeup more than the part of me who that likes to make a good movie. Yeah. yeah. And those are the ones that I think are most interesting in terms of the idea of, like, the Saturnalia <laughs> of this entire thing. It's kind of amazing that she doesn't get dragged out immediately, but she just has to wait. Yeah. Oh man, he's just riding out of there. You're like, right. You like know what? Major I didn't even Kong. think about that, but it is like kind of like almost like fawn-ish, right? Like I'm sorry, satyr-ish, like type stuff. It definitely has like some pagan themes on it, which I right. really like. And just the fact of wearing masks, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like these are the people they didn't let into the house and eyes wide shut. Well, yet again, it goes along with my theme of just like a demon lurking below an exterior. Sure. But underneath all those masks, it's all just Tom Cruise. Yeah. Do Scientologists celebrate Christmas? I don't. Do, Scient <laughs> do Scientologists have holidays? Tweet at us. No, they're working 24 7. Yeah. They're working around the clock. Is there like, like, do they celebrate the birth of Xenu or something like that? Or just like. Well, was Xenu born? Yeah, that's a question. Did he hatched in an egg? Or what happened with him? How's he doing? Like, is there... Do they have an Antichrist? <laughs> <laughs> I okay. feel like that would be some really strange mythology to draw on for your horror movie if they had some sort of demon. Are there Scientologist demons? There are, right? I don't know. Isn't don't... it like a situation like the movie The Visitor where it, like, turns Catholic mythos just Christian mythos into like sci-fi. I mean, it's he like wasn't was that great of a writer, so I don't know if he thought it that way, that far through. Right. Isn't it so weird that he released a soundtrack for one of his books? Yeah. I was telling you about that. Yeah. Like, and it's like considered, what? it's considered to be like one of the worst soundtracks for anything all time. Even like, how do you release a soundtrack <laughs> for your book? Like, when do I start playing it? Yeah. That's the question. I'm sure it has like instructions like, Oh, play this. But like, what if it's very pedantic instructions that it's like, you're gonna, it's like 10 tracks and it tells you which to play at, on like every single page. Like, what did she, why is she sacrificing herself here? Like, I know she, like, she has some connection to Krampus, but like, does she think she'll be able to stop it? Like, does she think it's coming for her? Like, well, the secret is that uh, she just wasn't, doesn't want to go outside in the cold. <laughs> it's cold. I'm old. My joints are going to hurt. And she's like, fuck it. You might as well just take me. And she wants to face him. Well, she's going to fucking die, so... Maybe she thinks... I don't know. 
Because, well, you do see Max being like, oh, I think this is all my fault, and her, like, dismissing that earlier If she on knows Krampus is coming, yeah. right? She, he might just think that, like, it's coming back for her at the end of her life now, but, like, no, it's actually Max's fault, so. Right. I don't know. We'll see right now if there's some sort of realization, but it is interesting whenever you shoot something that's a snow globe and you see a reflection of somebody walking through it, I can say that for sure. Yeah. That's a reference. And I do love the touch of like everything sort of starting to come back yeah. to life. They get a lot of mileage out of this image as well. Yeah, sorry I was being quiet, but like right. this is like a scene worth taking back and watching. Mm -hmm. It's very good. It's very well done. I can think of no better way to introduce a Krampus monster other than to have Krampus come down through the chimney. Smokily come out and... Yeah. And it's, uh. it's so interesting because there's so much to Krampus that you keep, like, looking for, like, where is its face? Where is its face? You know, like... Yeah, but you never, yeah. quite, you never quite get all of it. And Until it finally stands up then. Yeah. And it takes a long time. I like to think that, like, it didn't even realize she was there. I don't know. Like, I think it recognizes her now, but, like, I think it was just doing its, like, weird hellbound duty, but it's just like, oh, I remember you. I don't know. I don't know what the implication is with Krampus and, like, its own, in Krampus's own, like, interiority, you know? I have a feeling that Krampus is aware and here's my reason why. Well, I think he, I think he's aware now. I don't think he was aware before. No, I think he's aware all the time. Because here's the thing. If you're Santa, you've got a list of everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Krampus has a list of everybody. Oh, it's like it's a shared Google Docs between Santa and <laughs> Krampus. I keep telling Krampus not to edit that one part. And yeah. I can always tell that he did it like last week. <laughs> It's the worst. I'm going to make you just a viewer. Stop it. It's my page. Lucky I let to give, <laughs> give it to you at all. And it's also interesting that we have the really dramatic battle, right? Which is the first time we really come into contact with the scary creatures in a dramatic way, right? And it's an elongated sequence and we're already right towards like closing time for the movie. Yep. Right. We are now moving towards the, the finale and we know that because now we're outside and we're journeying and we know that people are going to start to be picked off after grandma's gone. Right. That's really the like the sort of the the exclamation point on the end of the second act, I feel like, is grandma meeting Krampus. Yeah. The rest of you, eh, you're fine. <laughs> Yeah. How many you I feel like you're out of the shells that Howard said he had left. But eh, it is what it is. Yeah. That is kind of an asshole thing to do is count the shells in movies or like when like there's a timer on something just being like, well actually twenty five seconds have passed. I mean sometimes though, you're like if I it, don't know about if this. It, if it extends to a ridiculous degree, then yeah. Like, well, you literally see it higher than it was before. Yeah. You're that, like, excuse me. You can't do that. You can't do that movie. You can lie to me, but you can't say that <laughs> what I just saw was not true. Yeah. <laughs> you can say that time is moving slower because it's a movie and suspend your disbelief. But like, right. keep things consistent at least. Or at least keep time consistent. Don't have it like take five minutes for it to go 10 seconds and then like have the last 10 seconds go instantly. Right. Are you at all disappointed that, uh, we don't get any like, well, this is like one-on-one -on -one time with like the moms and the kids kind of I'll, like, this is not even with the kids. I would have liked to see even more development of the mom and her sister. Right. Cause I think that's one of the more interesting character dynamics. But this is a thing that happens when you chose to have more and more characters. Like, right. If it was just Max at this point, then 
like, maybe it's time for Max and Mom. Yeah, a little bit. You get a little Tony Collette. You could have had extra time, but you know like, she's kind of good at acting with the young kids. We had an extra. We have evidence of this. Yes, we do. <laughs> In horror movies specifically, she's good at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but because we have this extra character here, apparently we need to have her. But yeah, whatever. It's it a is minor what it point. is. Yeah, I mean the movie knows exactly what it's trying to do, and, and like, it's just doing if the, it. If the movie died with like. Krampus leaving Max alone like it did to his grandmother forever ago. I'd kind of be disappointed with how rushed the ending is. Right. But like it ending with like the weird snow globe perfect Christmas ending. It's like, nah, there's a different point. I also love the, that fucking disappearance. Yeah. I'm going to go into the snow, but it's like I'm falling into the snow. That's so yeah. great. Everything that like every behavior that we have designed for all these creatures is so fucking thought through and perfect. Uh, it just reeks of somebody sitting down at a table with several other people and being like, "Just hear those this is the sleigh thing. bells jingling, ring what? ting tingling." Why are you too. singing? Stop it! This is not a time to sing, Max. Oh. This is very dramatic and creepy. Krampus is here, and uh, yeah, he's got a little. <laughs> he's uh, oh, is that his letter? Yeah, this is. Yep. yep. Yeah. So his Krampus got his letter that he sent. Yeah, this is all your fault. Yeah. Well, okay, we get it. Oh, and there's oh the bell. my God, it's the bell. <laughs> yeah, I was about to be like, really, movie? But And no. again, that's why I think it's, it's, you know, it's slightly pre-Nazi Germany and then Krampus is Nazis because yeah. it's a reminder of what happens after you lose faith in like a good thing and you turn to something that's bad, right? By the way, we were mentioning the ending and yeah. I'm curious... I, I know some people probably don't like the ending because they think it's kind of like, eh, what, what do you, how do you feel about it? I like it. Oh my God. I, I just want to appreciate this entire, like you said, almost Saturnalia festival. Like, right. It's Festivus, right? For the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> he said a bad word. You should have said, have they said they're one fuck that they're allowed for this yet. Yeah, they're not allowed to say anything else, right? I, I don't know if they've said they're one fuck, because that would have been a great opportunity to blow it. I think uh, Conchata said fuck at some point, right? Yeah, okay. It, I mean, if you're going to have someone say it. Yeah. It's got to be her. <laughs> the way she threw that bell made it look really like it was very heavy. <laughs> God, everything is lit perfectly in this. Now we get the real CGI moment of the movie. Yeah. Which is okay. I think the philosophy of this movie and the way it uses CGI is perfect, where it mostly uses CGI for things that... Are we going to talk about like his hell ram reindeer equivalents on his sleigh? Which oh, you mean those? Yeah, yeah, those are great. So there's so many like little things to talk about, and there's like this right. one small fragment of the movie. Right. Well, again, it's just a movie that is rich in minutia and details. And the reason why that is not frustrating to me is because it clearly also spends effort into thinking through those images instead of just being like, look at all this stuff that we thought of. Yeah. But th was your movie good? Well, no, not really. Well, okay. <laughs> and also it's vague enough where like you can sort of imply a lot of stuff about it and how all the rules work and whatnot. Right. Oh, God. It shows you its work just enough. <laughs> oh, man. I really love what they do with lighting uh, Krampus's eyes as well. Yeah. And the way they have, like, the catch light, sort of, but it's, like, a very specific... It's done very specifically, except for there, where there's two. Well, um, no, I like that, though. Like, the... The underneath. I also like that, like, you're kind of expecting... This is another subversion where you're kind of expecting, like, 
oh, he made the right choice, so his family will be back, but like they'll forget him or whatnot. Right. But, but no. It's you don't get that happy ending in this movie. Well, you get he gets what he wants all along, but it's the genie thing. Yeah, yeah. It's also a punishment. It's the idea that there really is no going back, is there? No. And it's like, no, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd ever noticed that before. They get so pumped that they just ram each other's heads. <laughs> Oh, God. That would be... I know I said I'd like to own a prop from them, but since that's probably decayed, like, if I could own something from Krampus, that'd be cool, too. <laughs> what would you want to own? Um, well, if I'm a millionaire and I have enough room, I'd love to own, like, the full-body uh, Krampus thing, but... Um, would you walk around in it? No. I would just, like, have it as a statue or something like that. Oof. But... Christmas was always... This is how Christmas used to be when it was Saturnalia and we sacrificed right. people. But it's also, in some weird way, it's kind of like... <laughs> the Spy Kids CGI-looking moment. Oh, God. In a weird way, that's kind of like an idea of nostalgia, too. Right? Yeah. It's like this weird, like, and now you're going to get sheer nostalgia here, right? Yeah. Which is, like, somehow painful and terrible. Robot Chicken. What? Do you see that? Yeah. I mean, well, he is... Okay. And, oh, my God, there's a fucking Rick and Morty thing back there. I have never noticed that before. Holy shit. <laughs> and a panda bear? What? No, that's weird. Um, did somebody... Does somebody? I mean, look how softly this is all lit Did now. somebody on this movie work yeah. at Adult Swim? Because that makes sense if they have the robot chicken and the uh, Rick maybe. and Morty stuff. Maybe. The set designer maybe worked at Adult Swim or something. Maybe Max did. Yeah. He's... He's actually secretly Dan Harmon. He's <laughs> lost a couple hundred pounds in a couple of decades of years, but that's what he looks like. <laughs> what if you could lose <laughs> decades. decades? Yeah. That'd be really interesting. Because then if you could lose them, the implication would also be that you could gain them. Yeah. I think both of us would be fucked there. No, yeah, we'd be 85. We'd be standard. Yeah, we'd be 85 we'd already. Do, we'd be standard in Waldorf at this point. Just yeah. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, this is just so much exactly what he wanted with Christmas being the way it used to be. Yeah, and look at this Hallmark commercial looking. Yep. In a weird way, the consummation of it is exactly equally as shallow and devoid of any sort of substance or value as everything at the beginning of the movie, right? It comes back around 100%. I haven't felt some ever since the Pope died. It's a very Catholic thing. Um, no, you did not, sir. Yeah. You absolutely did not. Did you think it was going to be some sort of twist when you were watching this in the moment? Uh, I, I was waiting for something to happen. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a twist or like, what's, gonna, right. what's going on? There's something more. It's too different. Yeah. Yeah. And it like it's lit with a dreamlike quality almost where it's like... Ah, right. Ah, well, ah. it's so much the soft lighting of yeah. this that it's like, this is not real. Yeah. Right? Brass knuckles. <laughs> yeah. And I really do feel like it's an interesting... This is, I think, the most interesting way I imagine this, this movie ending. Oh my God, I don't even remember that. What the fuck was that thing? It's supposed to be like, oh, the rednecks got them on taxidermy to animal. But workers. what animal is it? Is that like a slow loris? <laughs> what, <laughs> what, is, what is that? A you demented on slow lorises. <laughs> you brought them up last time too. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it was before we started recording, but... Slow yeah. loris. It's just an interesting name. Merry Christmas, everyone. And a happy new year. And here we get the truth. Yeah. All the objects you've com accumulated are worthless. <laughs> because the thing is, the problem with the nostalgia is that, like... Well, and also, like, I, the movie could have ended here, where it's just, like, if you wanted a happy ending, it would be fine if it ended there. But no, you don't get that. You get, like you said, the genie yeah. exploitation of the wish. And maybe you could see it. Even well, this is like, I love this where like, is it everybody realizing what happened yeah. or is it like, yes. 
Or is it like they're well, all... Well, you hear the voices of like the things they said throughout the movie, too. Or was it... I always kind of got the thing that like the other people aren't really there. Like it's sort of an internal hell for Max now. No, I think it's all okay. of them. I think it's all of them. And, uh, you know, in a weird way, the movie does a weird thing where it like relies on very similar imagery. You, you might roll your eyes on at this to Citizen Kane. Okay, sure. We have the sleigh bell, yeah. right? And it's about to pull back to a snow globe, which again, how does Citizen Kane open? He drops the snow, snow globe and it shatters finally once he dies. Rosebud. <laughs> exactly. And what is Rosebud? It's his sled that he got for Christmas. And that represents his childhood and his youth and, that he never had. And this type of like return to something he felt like he lost and like nostalgia for that idea. Also like eh, the one flaw I have with this ending is like the bleh moment at the end. But I do love Krampus's lair. It's perfect. Oh, you mean just all the snow globes? No, this moment. Like, oh, what's the point of that? But yeah, that's stupid. But yeah, no, the rest of it is fucking perfect. Right, uh, and uh, it's this weird thing. Everybody is trapped in their own bubble, and uh, even if you had the perfect thing that you wanted, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's really interesting how the movie sort of arrives at that conclusion, and it it totally brings back everything from the beginning of the movie in terms of what a shallow Christmas idea is and, and how it creates this illusion. Right. Yeah. And, uh, it's the same thing with those two parents at the beginning doing the smiling thing for Santa. Right. And they're like sobbing. Yeah. It's exactly the same type of idea. Good actor Thor. (laughs) But yeah, really interesting ending. Um, very interesting how it relies on it's bold, the contrast too. between the like this idea of what's real and what's fake and what's like artificial. Yeah. I, um, are these like actual I think these are the these look like like No, actual, these are CG too. Are they? Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> Fuck you. No, I was gonna like <laughs> say these are like the cast's actual Christmas photos. I mean, I don't know, probably. Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> David Keckner's Christmas yeah. photo. Yeah, I 100% believe that's David Keckner's actual Christmas card. Right. Um, well, you're, you had got his Christmas card. Yeah, I'm personal friends with him. Well, he's your uh, dad. <laughs> Look at the fucking German. Like, oh, it's the Krampus. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do that again, please? <laughs> no. Oh, man. I'm going to use that as a soundbite <laughs> just in future episodes. Random. Oh, it's the Krampus. Oh. Uh, but anyway. Oh, that was Krampus. <laughs> I can't do it as well as you. What? Oh, it's the Krampus. Um, oh, my God. Look at that. <laughs> oh, it's another one. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. But, yeah, that was Krampus. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the movie. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. I hope you get wrecked as shit on New Year's. And I can't wait to see you next year. Uh, I don't know if I agree with all those things. But uh, you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. <laughs> Uh, we have episodes on Stitcher, Spotify, and iTunes, and that's it. That's really all there is. Uh, and yeah, this has been Krampus, and uh, I can't think of a good way to end the episode, but Max, do you have any magic transitions up your ass, or any presents for people with this transition of an ending to... No? <laughs> all right, well, uh, I guess I'm on my own here. Max I, has I, been I, taken. I guess I'm going to ask Santa for a better way to end our shows. There you go. (laughs) See you later, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.